Battlefield. Hello from part three of my definitely scientifically accurate list of games that made the Amiga great. You can find parts one and two linked in the description below because we live in the future and hyperlinks exist. I've probably even put this in a playlist like a clever blighter would. The third and final instalment of the games that made the Amiga great is, shockingly, of a similar theme to the last two. The games are different, though. You may be sad or angry or just aimlessly upset that I didn't put in that one game you love more than anything else, but, well, that's just because it was a bad game and you got it wrong as a child. Sorry. So, for the last time, for what it's worth, for what they mean to me, for how they changed my life, these are the third 11 of the 31 games that made the Amiga great. Megalomania. You'll see a few sensible software games across the three parts of this list, and for me, none deserves its place more than cannon fodder. But also, Megalomania is up there too, because it's one of the best examples of an Amiga real-time strategy title ever made. And one of the only ones, admittedly, but it is a wonderful little game, no doubt about it. Over on the PC, people were suffering through and pretending to love some seriously hardcore, thoroughly opaque strategy games. Megalomania instead mixed its strategy with a much more straightforward approach, some might call it simplified, and they wouldn't really be wrong. The overall package is one that is, dare I say it, easy to pick up and hard to master? Especially when those bastard AI opponents jump you with a hundred pipe lobbing units and he's still in the prehistoric era. Megalomania also works surprisingly well as a message of anti-nuclear proliferation. You can develop nukes to lob in the direction of your opponents, which result in guaranteed instant complete destruction. They also, one, can result in an immediate counter-attack if your opponent has nuclear countermeasures installed, and two, render the tile your opponent previously occupied unusable, because, like, nukes and that. We've nuked them! I still harbour rather tragic dreams of a sequel, something I saw dev diaries for in Amiga Power, the world's greatest games magazine, about 54 years ago. It existed. It was being made. Then, for whatever reason, it wasn't being made. Megalomania 2, and my dreams, died back then. I'm aware this isn't an uplifting start to the list, so I'm not even sorry. Pinball Dreams I only said the name of one game just then, but I'm including Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies, and Pinball Illusions here as one entry because in making this list I introduced some fail-safes that allow me to modify its structure at will. Also, there are a selection of fine pinball games that are brilliant by themselves and together form one true masterpiece, so quite frankly it's hard for me to separate them. What you've got is a bunch of different tables across the three games, basically, with a few tweaks and tucks between each version. It's a reasonably good simulation of ball physics, considering dreams and fantasies are made for your bog-standard Amiga 500s. An illusion takes special advantage of the A1200 because… multi-ball. Pinball is so cool. If you're sticking with console development, you're going to end up with a much simpler pinball game, or maybe one with more complexity but less actual pinball, like maybe Sonic Spinball on the Mega Drive. As such, the Dreams Etc. series is one that's very much Amiga from flipper to flipper. No idea what happened to its developer in the past couple of decades, though. Some kind of Swedish outfit called Dice? Nah, no idea. Things were bettered years later by Slam Tilt, which would definitely have made its home on this list as a genuine proper entry where it released just a year or two earlier. As it stands, this was another case of late, i.e. 1996 release, and another time where I get to remind you that literally nobody in the world had an Amiga by that point. Even the people who squawk in the comments that they did have one and that I'm wrong, are wrong. All Amigas exploded in December 1995 after the PlayStation had proved itself dominant. There's no point claiming otherwise. Speedball 2 Sport is, as we all know, terrible and should be shunned. Everyone who plays sport is a nimrod, and so everyone who likes sport is, by extension, also a nimrod. Now that I've alienated those of you who don't get that I'm not even joking, I'm just lying, we can talk about one of the Amiga's best sports games, Speedball 2. Doing away with nonsense like most rules and rubbish like that, which usually just gets in the way, the second Speedball tells a surprisingly mundane tale of an underdog team making its way to the top of the league in a futuristic sport where you can score goals for points or just batter the opposition into submission. I still have fever dreams about playing against Super Nashwan, well, losing against Super Nashwan in the first division, my team of scraped together free agents and the OG keeper Barry stood between the sticks just not quite good enough to compete with those gits at the Nash. I'm sure these days I could probably beat them because I'd be paying more attention to things like tactics and training my default team up to be something truly special instead of just trying to injure as many in the opposition as I can, but yeah, fever dreams. 
Speedball 2 is one of those things you look back on with genuine love, and it's one of those things you can still play today and get a lot from. Its straightforward nature lends itself to being something that stands whatever the fabled test of time might be. Admittedly, it's also one of the most 90s things that's ever happened, with the unmistakable Bitmap Brothers sheen to everything, lots of chunky grey metal, and a dystopian air hanging over everything. Then again, this dystopian future in which people can only be entertained by showing up in their droves to watch a literal blood sport where their favourite athletes get beaten half to death for the amusement of strangers does have ice cream, so it can't all be bad. God, Speedball 2 is great. Super Skid Marks A finer example of the purity of Britishness in game development on that oh-so-British of systems the Amiga you will not find. Super Skid Marks is God Save the Queen in game form, full of the sorts of daft comedy and banal silliness you always think of when you're playing any games on a British computer in Britain. I mean, technically the Amiga was owned by a company that began life in Canada and was invented by a man from the States, and in the real world Super Skid Marks was crafted in the way down under over in New Zealand, but um, two of those three countries I just mentioned have the Queen on their money, so there's that, I suppose. Seriously though, racing Mini Coopers, cows with wheels, and dragging caravans around an undulating dirt track and calling your game a slang term for poo stains in your underpants, you'd be forgiven for believing Super Skid Marks another product of the UK bedroom coder scene. Even though that's not the case, it is still a brilliant game and one fondly remembered in the Amiga meetups we have on a weekly basis. You can see how much fit is important to a game when you compare Super Skid Marks reception on the Amiga, where people loved it, to that on the Mega Drive, where half of you only just discovered it was released on the Mega Drive, that wager. It fit on one, not the other. Not only is it a game made of pure Amiga deliciousness, Acid Games, the Kiwis behind Super Skid Marks, messed about behind the scenes in the way you can only do when you're making something with a specific format in mind. Link at play, split screen options, even a multi-monitor setup are all available here, and it's testament to both the dev team and the hardware that it's all possible. Super Skid Marks might have a daft name, but it's a genuine Amiga legend. Less special mention than usual goes to the original Skid Marks, which is more like a test version of Super Skid Marks than anything else. It's good fun and hints at the greatness to come in the sequel, but it is let down by the fact it keeps on bloody crashing and I can't just download an auto-update to fix it. Past gaming is very irritating. Shadow of the Beast Hello, Controversy! You see, it turns out games with Beast in the name closely associated with a single format tend to be a bit rubbish, but people remember them as good. See Altered Beast on the Mega Drive, which was horrible, and two of the three Shadow of the Beast games on the Amiga, which were gorgeous, imaginative, and unique bad games. It's fair to say that back in 1989 there hadn't really been anything out there to set the Amiga apart from the pack. A lot of games were Atari ST ports, arcade ports, movie tie-ins, things coming in from elsewhere. People didn't think of Commodore's machine quite as its own thing. Then Shadow of the Beast came out and changed it all. Its incredible graphics with that parallax scrolling and one of the finest soundtracks of the era made people sit up and go, oh right, so the Amiga can do its own stuff and can do it a lot better then, I see. I was blind and stupid, but now the light has shone in my eyes and blinded me? No, I don't know what they said really, but Shadow of the Beast did blow us all away. Shadow of the Beast 2 made the music and graphics even better, ladling on that thick atmosphere that hits you right in the gut with its otherness. It helps to hammer home the series as a distinct thing, an Amiga series that stands out, one to pay attention to. But it's not a great game. In fact, I think Shadow 2 is just out and out bad. Impossible to do anything on without cheating, obscure to the point of irritation, full of insta-death and dead ends. But hey, it, it's an Amiga great, if not actually a great game. And Shadow of the Beast 3 is… okay, I guess? It doesn't really fit this entry as it was out long after the series still mattered, but it is still part of the series so gets its moment in the spotlight here. Hello, Shadow 3, and goodbye again. The Secret of Monkey Island I wouldn't at all think of The Secret of Monkey Island as the kind of game most people immediately associate with the Amiga. I would, however, think of it as the kind of game people who owned an Amiga would immediately associate with both their younger years and the machine itself. If you had an Amiga, you had Monkey Island. And it's clear why. It's gorgeous, witty, funny, unique, has a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle, features some of the greatest music ever committed to gamedom, and generally is the template by which all future point-and-click adventure games went on to be made. Amiga owners around the world have been locked in discussions as to what you actually do with the rubber chicken with the pulley in the middle for decades now, and those of us who discovered it's possible to kill Guybrush Street with back in 1990 have never been the same since. 
It might not have been specifically made with the Amiga in mind, but Monkey Island on the Amiga is a true great, and a fine example of my benevolence in accepting Outlanders like this into the hallowed halls of this list. I am rubber, you are glue. How appropriate, you fight like a cow. Honourable mention goes to Monkey Island 2, as you'd expect, with a few things, well, 11 things, holding it back from being a true Amiga great. With the added complexity of the game came huge amounts of additional data, all needing to be squeezed onto the Amiga's tiny floppy disks. As such, Monkey Island 2 needed 11 of these disks, like one more than 10, and saw frequent game pause and disk swaps necessary to play it. While the original Monkey Island is a true great on the format, Monkey 2 highlights the exact point where games started to slip out of the Amiga's grip in favour of the ever-improving PC. Worms. I'd hazard there's a small chance you've heard of Worms, the turn-based arcade simulation of extreme violent combat as carried out by tiny squeaky-voiced annelids who are all a dab hand with a bazooka. It came out of seemingly nowhere and took over the world for a year or two, and it all began on the Amiga back in 1995. A mixture of cute characters, funny voices, well, they, they make me laugh. Careful strategy, skill, timing, and sheer blind luck as a wayward grenade manages to take out half of two opposition teams, Worms is a fine example of purity in both design and spirit. It knows exactly what it wants to do, it does it, then it adds a few little extras like randomised levels and customisable teams to get you more involved. I love Worms, and while it has propagated everywhere since its release, it is very much an Amiga great. Actually, in doing some extra research just now, I've realised World's Greatest Gaming Magazine, Amiga Power, gave Worms 60% and derided it for being boring. So I have to change my opinion here and fall in line with those whose mag I genuinely loved. Worms has always been dull and a 60% game. That is clear to me now. Even though it provided me with actual years of entertainment and talking about it has given me cravings to play it again right now, I have to say it's mediocre. I'm lying, by the way. Worms is great. Sorry, Amiga Power. Super duper special mention goes to Worms the Director's Cut, the Amiga exclusive update to the original, which released in 1997 to rave reviews and sold a whopping 5,000 copies worldwide. Because by 1997, nobody cared about the Amiga. Being a bit nicer, the Director's Cut was a lovely little thank you from Team 17 to the Amiga, as it was the computer that helped put the developer on the map, as well as the original home of one of its most enduring franchises. Walker. If I were talking of the Texas Ranger, then this is the point I could make some hilarious, witty Chuck Norris comments about how he does push-ups and is strong because I have my finger on the pulse of internet meme culture. I won't. Though instead I'll talk about DMA Designs Walker, yes, the same studio that became Rockstar North, and how it was one of the most unique, interesting, decidedly Amiga-ish and ultimately special games on Commodore's set of home computer boxes. Naturally, having just made Lemmings, DMA moved on to a game where you're a giant mech stomping about through time and destroying wave upon wave of enemy troops and tanks and cannons and trains and horses. That just makes sense. Walker stands out from a crowded market of side-scrolling shooty action games in a few ways, one of which being how things move from right to left, instead of the more traditional left to right. It doesn't change much as to what actually happens when you play it, but my word, it's memorable for it. Sound-wise and graphically, Walker is obviously a standout performer. This is a game you want to show people as part of the Amiga's lineup, and it's something you can be proud to call a genuine exclusive on the machine. And, of course, there's the keyboard scheme. Using a joystick or keyboard to move the mech and mouse to aim and fire the cannons, you're presented with a control scheme that wouldn't be possible on the consoles of the day. Walker is Amiga to its very core. It's so very handy that it's great fun to play too, otherwise all of this wild praise would have felt a bit pointless. Championship Manager Series Balance a shoe on the spacebar to speed all your matches up without having to move yourself while playing a 1-4-5 formation to win every match 12-8 and bringing Cambridge United from nothing to superstardom in a matter of just a few seasons. It's the Championship Manager way, and just another facet of the Amiga and its uncanny ability to have every single kind of game ever making a home on it. Champman is either an addiction you work through or something you've never played properly, and the Amiga was immediately elevated to the heady levels of machine that got enough playtime to make a genuine dent in the national grid's output when Champ hooked up with Commodore. As well as being something I'm still addicted to today, though, Champ is a national treasure and made its popular home on the Amiga. Let me explain that. While also a PC game, and I honestly have no idea if it was made with PCs in mind from the start, more people I knew growing up had Amigas, so more people were playing the game there. 
Football management games were nothing new, but the scope of simulation on offer and the mind-altering level of depth on show meant Champ was, and is, unlike anything else on the Amiga. Its appearance and success proved to the world that this was a computer capable of doing anything those £1,000-plus PCs could, and you weren't just stuck with that and no other games. Well, apart from Doom, the best game ever made. Hmm. My arguments got away from me a bit there. Still, Championship Manager on the Amiga is and forever will be amazing and important. I have spoken. Naturally, there's a special mention here for the 1997 release of a 1995 game that could only possibly run on a PC with any degree of success, Championship Manager 2, which hit the Amiga 1200 after massive delays and its original creators saying, nah, we can't do that. It was not worth the wait, it did not work properly, and I would have seriously doubted the future of the series if I'd only been exposed to the Amiga version. Great times. Dynablaster. There's a few games in this list that serve a specific purpose, helping the Amiga stand its ground in an ever more crowded gaming world. The consoles were encroaching with things like ease of use, having great games, and not costing £400, tempting fools into buying them. We needed even more things on the Amiga to show that Old Faithful was capable enough that it could pump out console-quality arcade titles. The SNES might be remembered as the home of Bomberman, Super Bomberman technically, but it's the Amiga that's remembered as the home of Dynablaster, which is actually the 1990 version of Bomberman with a different name. I don't know why. Anyway, Dynablaster showed, chose, the Amiga is capable of hosting brilliant, fun multiplayer games and, with the right jiggery-pokery and wires, allows up to five people to play at the same time. It was just, like, Blammo! By the way, this machine you think is only good for deluxe paint and making workbench talk can actually be used as a genuine party game machine, and my whole world changed. I have literally never played Dynablaster in 5 player mode. Supercars 2. There's a small chance I may be showing my personal bias here and in including a game that objectively probably doesn't belong on this list. Why the hell would Supercars 2 be something that made the Amiga great? What impact did it have on the machine, on Commodore, and the industry that helped our trusty A500, 600, and 1200 stand out, beyond just the fact that I liked it a lot? Well, there's logic behind this choice, if you'll indulge me. Supercars 2 was my game for the Amiga. It was the one I associate only with the Amiga. The first one that pops into my head when someone says Amiga, which is always confusing when I'm in Spain. Syndicate might be my favourite on the Amiga, but through the years I've actually played it much more on PC and its sequel on PlayStation. Supercars 2 remains resolutely in the realm of being an Amiga game in my brain. What I'm getting to in a laboured way is that we all have an Amiga game, if we played the machine at any point. We all have a North and South, a Mick and Mac Global Gladiators, a Fire Force, an Apocalypse, a Sabre Team, a Degeneration, a Gemex, a Flood, a Jet Strike, a Rough and Tumble, a Paradroid 90, a Banshee, a Benefactor, I, I could go on, but that would just give me far more work to do in playing all of these games to record them. The point is, one of the best, most important games that was ever made for the Amiga was the one you loved the most. And that's something that can be lost in the mix when we're trying to quantify this kind of thing. And that, chums, is part three of the list of Amiga games, with all 31 now out there for you to soak in the delicious glory of. You can watch the other two parts via my channel if you miss them, or if you just want to watch them again and get really frustrated that I didn't include Exile. And never forget how bloody great the Amiga was. Thanks for watching, please do like, share, subscribe, at least emulate an Amiga, justify doing so morally to yourself, get hooked on an obscure Amiga format demo disc, get over the fact Kid Gloves isn't on this list, and somehow get through your life. Oh, and I now have a Patreon, which you can find the link to in the blurb below. If you like this video, and the others I've done, and you've got a bit of spare change, consider chipping in. If you can't or don't want to, that's also fine, I am still fond of you. I'd like to offer my heartiest thanks to the following peeps for their $5 or more support on Patreon. Without you, I'd be dead, which I should stop saying as it's patently untrue. And of course, a huge thanks to the higher tier contributors who helped me to afford beans and soup. Video Brains, or Jake Tucker, Takara Hoshi, Robbie Sabo, Lola Osman. Even if you're not mentioned, you're good people and a top pooch. Thank you for your continued support, it helps stave off these unending headaches, though the migra leave also helps. Bye bye.